Women Taking the Lead, Episode 21. Life is either a daring adventure or nothing. Hello, my name is Jody Flynn and welcome to Women Taking the Lead, where we are all about creating blasts of inspiration to help you overcome self-doubt so you can lead with confidence, integrity, and a sense of humor. This episode is sponsored by Luma Coaching. Want some support to get your dreams off the ground? Go to womentakingthelead.com forward slash coaching to sign up for a consultation with me. Now, your future awaits, so let's get started. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm here with Julie Austin, who is an award-winning author, inventor, and innovation speaker. Her patented product, Swiggy's Wrist Water Bottles, have been a NASDAQ Product of the Year semifinalist and are currently sold in 24 countries. Julie and her products have appeared on The Today Show, The Queen Latifah Show, HGTV, Lifetime, ABC, CBS, NBC, Fox News, and The Wall Street Journal, a along with dozens of TV shows, magazines, and radio shows around the world. She's, a be- she's been a keynote innovation speaker for corporations such as Procter & Gamble, amongst many others, and she's also been featured in the books Patently Female and Girls Think of Everything. Julie, that's just a little intro for everyone, so tell us more about you and your own humble beginnings. Wow, that was really a mouthful. I didn't realize yeah. <laughs> It's alphabet soup in there. (laughs) Um, Well, I I started out in the beginning as an actor. Um, I did. I was a TV host, and I've also worked behind the camera doing uh, TV and film distribution. And I still kind of work in that field a little bit, but um, transitioned out of that into (laughs) being an inventor, which. Nothing in my entire life would prepare me to be an inventor. It's not like you can go to college and learn how to be an inventor. It's just something that you really kind of have to learn yourself. And when I started, there were no books on the topic. I had no mentors, nothing. I really had to figure every single thing out on my own. And when I did start, you talk about humble beginnings. Um, I literally... I was in a bad relationship. I was running for my life. I had $5 to my name. So I had to learn to be a hustler. I moved into my apartment. I said, look, can I pay you at the end of the month? I'll have a job by then. I mean, I just had to bootstrap and wing it, you know, constantly, which is great for a, for an entrepreneur. It's great training. Um, you know, unless you you have millions of dollars in venture capital, which rarely happens right off the bat. But so I started out, what happened was I wanted to invent a product. Um, and the product came because I passed out from dehydration while I was running in the heat in Texas. And that kind of, it, it really presented itself, the opportunity. I said, okay, I've been thinking about doing something, creating a business or doing something. And here it is. So I started looking around to see if there was some kind of way that I could carry water on me, like a water bottle on the wrist is what I came up with and nothing existed. So that's where I started. Um, And it took a long, long time because I had no money. I literally had $5 to my name. I started with a ball of clay and made a prototype. That's where I started. I said, okay, let me take it step by step. Went and got a job, got saved up a little money, got a mold made. (laughs) This is really a hard way to start an invention, but a lot of inventors do it this way. And, And from there, I just kept growing it and, you know, getting a little inventory, selling the inventory, and it just kind of growing it very slowly. Wow. 
Wow, Julie, you've had you've clearly come a long way from when you, you first <laughs> started, when you said you were on the run and had to do some hustling. But even hustling, you know, there's some confidence there. You you have to have some confidence to to do a little bit of hustling and making those promises, right? You're like, I'm gonna make this happen. But take us back to a time when you were playing small and you may not have been aware of it at the time. Share with us the story and the lessons you learned. Well, I mean, I did really, really start small and I didn't have the money to pay people to do anything. Um, I had to do everything myself, meaning I would drive. This is when I was manufacturing in the U.S. I would drive out to pick up the the um, the product. I would drive to get the bands. I would drive somewhere else to get the caps and to get the packaging. And I would sit in my apartment and put these things together over the weekend. And (laughs) I had a boyfriend at the time and he would come over on Friday and I go, nope, this is what I have to do. I've got, you know, if you want to see me, we're going to have, we'll watch TV and we're going to put together these these, uh, they were called hydro sports at the time before I changed the name. We're going to put together these water bottles. <laughs> and so that was my life for a long time. You know, just doing the little tiny things. I had to do every single thing from the ground up. So that was really starting small, but I was thinking big. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Now, was there ever a time where you might have held yourself back because you didn't think you were capable or that you were good enough? You doubted your ability to succeed. Many, many times. I really quit many times because it was so overwhelming. And I just kept saying, you know, This is just, I'm bootstrapping it. I'm trying to get into stores, which is really hard. A lot of inventors tend to think, oh, I'm going to go to Walmart and Kmart and Target. And it's not the way to think. But that's how I was thinking. And so I had no idea um, what to do. But if you want to talk about overcoming the self-doubt, I decided to put these to my car (laughs) and I drove to the corporate headquarters of a big sporting goods chain on the West coast. I literally just walked into the office. I didn't call. And I said, I have something to show that I I think I was going to go up higher than the buyer. I wasn't sure who, who was going to see me, but I wasn't leaving until someone saw me. And I went in and uh, I said, I've got this product. It's a patented product. There's nothing like it on the market. What do you think? And I was really kind of shocked because he said, okay, we'll take it (laughs) for all of our stores. I went, oh, great. And then I walked out and I went, "Um, I don't think I have that many. (laughs) (laughs) But I'll figure out a way to get them. Nice. Awesome, Julie. Now, share with us a time in your journey when you had a wake-up call. Take us back to that moment and share with us the steps that you took that led to your success. There were really two of them. But the first one was, I and, and a lot of entrepreneurs get into this, A lot, especially a lot of inventors, um, will tend to think, Somebody else can do this for me. (laughs) I'm going to pay someone to do this for me because I don't know how. And they're, you know, this they're they know more than I do. So I went to a um, a company that does infomercials and I thought, okay, I'm just going to license this product. They're going to take it over. I'm going to get a royalty and that'll be that. And it went back and forth between their lawyers, someone else's lawyers, my lawyers. And it just went around and around for almost a year. And and, and, and in that year, I'm taking it off the market. I'm not doing anything. I'm just waiting. And what ended up happening, the company that I was going to (laughs) go into business with, right before Everything was going to happen. They went bankrupt. (laughs) 
So you want to talk about a wake up call. I've been waiting and waiting and waiting for that to happen and it didn't happen. And and luckily it happened that way because then it all went back to me. All the rights reverted back to me. And I said, you know what? I can't waste any more time. I am going to have to do this all myself. I'm going to have to promote it, um, distribute it. I'm going to have to do everything. And that was, um, that was kind of a scary moment because <laughs> I haven't done anything like that before. And what did you do to turn it around? Cause now you're, it's back in your lap, but you still don't know really what you're doing in terms of creating the infomercial and all of that. What did you do after that happened? Well, I actually did have a friend um, because I've worked in Hollywood. I have a lot of contacts up doing my first commercial. I did a commercial and an infomercial. They were the ones who did all of the Rocky movies. So it was a fantastic looking slick commercial, Um, not an infomercial. I had one of those done too. And then You know, I realized that it's really going to be, it's going to fall on me to bootstrap this. And I'll just tell you real quick, I did have another wake up call. (laughs) And uh, this is a big, big, big lesson right here. Um, I thought, okay, I can't do it all. Maybe I'll get somebody else to help me, somebody who can do it for me, right? And the guy turned out to be the biggest con artist And I met him through a friend who recommended him and he had celebrity clients. So I thought, oh, he's got to be okay. He's worked with all these people. Oh boy. He was, you know, he traveled across the country scamming entrepreneurs out of millions. And so that was a huge lesson. It took me off the market again, you know, going through the whole legal process for probably six to eight months. And that is the last time I ever made that mistake. What would you do differently if you could go back? Well, of course, obviously, you ha- as an entrepreneur, you better learn how to do everything. And, and, and a lot of the biggest, most successful entrepreneurs I know of, they swept the floor, they carried boxes, they got their hands dirty, and they still... They never gave it up. They did all of that stuff, their business. They never got out of their business and said, oh, I'll just let other people do it. So you always have to get your hands dirty and keep yourself in your business aware of what's going on and be willing to do uh, everything. So what was the question? What would I do different? Um, (laughs) uh, I think that is one thing that I would have done differently. And another thing I just wanted to say that I would do differently is when I did have success, like in the very beginning, when I got into the chain stores, I tend, I would tend to take that money and go, okay, now I'm going to spend $10,000 on a trade show and $20,000 on this. And I really should have pulled that back. And, and done what was working, which is the most creative things. You know, the, the free creative things you have to do to bootstrap a business. Yeah. And I love that you make this point. And also Marnie Batista, who is in episode two, talked about this as well, that, you know, although, you know, it's good to delegate and have a team and people who support you, you should really know how to do everything in your business before you pass it off to other people right? so that, so that you can, you know, what's going on so that you, you can kind of keep, keep a handle on what's going on in your business. And chances are you may not need to hire as many people as you, you need to, th- as you think you need to hire or spend as much money as you think you need to spend. You'll know the value of the service you're paying for when you're able to do it yourself. And she said she lost thousands of dollars because of that. And it's not, and you, it sounds like you went, you lost time, you lost yep. money because of this belief that you wouldn't be able to handle all of those things. So that's, that's really huge. And now I have a distributor. So it's a big difference in having a distributor, what they do. This is in 24 countries around the world. I sell almost like 90% of what I sell is international. 
And so they buy straight from the factory. They had their own reps. They do their own thing. It's, it's a much easier way to work. And Julie, what I want everyone to get is there's no one way to lead. We're all different and we're going to lead differently. So how would you describe your leadership style? I would say that I'm uh, hands off because I, if I hire someone, I, first of all, I never hire anybody based on a resume. I could care less what's on your resume. <laughs> I could care less what school you went to. I don't care. What I care about is problem solvers because I'm a small business and um, one of the most expensive things uh, in your business is going to be when you when you hire someone. Yeah, that's the affects your bottom line more than anything. So if I hire someone, they have to be a self starter. They have to be creative. They have to be a, a problem solver and someone who is. You know, I don't have to babysit. I say, you know, here's what needs to be done for the week and and it gets done and and above and beyond what I ask for. That's huge. And what is one thing that you're working on right now that you're really excited about? Well, this has nothing to do with my invention, but it does have to do with creating and running multiple businesses. I wrote a book called The Money Garden, How to Plant the Seeds for a Lifetime of Income. And it's about how to create and run multiple businesses, which sounds really overwhelming, but it doesn't have to be. Um, so one of the businesses I created is um, speaker sponsor and indie sponsor. It's a small business sponsorship for speakers and artists. So Everyone is on the bandwagon of, oh, get Nike and Coca-Cola and, you know, IBM to sponsor you for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Well, that's great if you happen to get it. It's kind of like winning the lottery. But there are 25 million small businesses just in the U.S. alone. And I've gotten sponsorship for projects, you know, from actually from Europe. Um, I've gotten them you know, as low as $300 to sponsor a breakout session at a conference to $60,000 to produce a play. So um, I really feel passionate about that because small business sponsorship hasn't happened basically since the Industrial Revolution. And before that, since the Renaissance, it's always been wealthy, the wealthy sponsoring artist. But now with Kickstarter and all the, the crowdfunding and, you know, it's, it's gotten to a point where um, the average person has a say in sponsoring, you know, an artist. And so uh, I just feel really passionate about that. And small businesses are the only it's the only area left that hasn't been tapped. And it's an untapped gold mine, really. Yes. And coming from Maine, wh who. The, and the economy of Maine is fueled by small business. So I know exactly what you mean. And I actually have someone I think I want to put you in contact with who talks a lot about funding for um, women-owned businesses. And I think you two could have a fantastic conversation. Ah, that's what it's all about, networking. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> now I'm going to do a quick leadership roundup. So tell us, what is one practice that makes you a better leader, Julie? I think the one practice uh, that makes me a better leader is that, and, and by the way, I did not start out wanting to be a leader. <laughs> I, I wanted to license this product and be done with it. I did not want to be a leader. So I'm a reluctant leader. Um, <laughs> but once you step into that role, you better own it. Um, so I think constantly um, know, knowing the other side and being able to empathize with the people that I hire, you know, I, I've been in that situation. I've been the employee, so I, I know what it's like. So I think being able to, um, to understand their side of it and to appreciate the people that work for me, I, I am known to give bonuses, to pay way above minimum wage when I have those kind of projects, um, way above 
uh, a regular salary. So I don't want to be told what kind of salary I have to pay people. I just tend to pay people more anyway. So I think being appreciative of your employees. And what is one book that you would recommend to a woman to help her develop her leadership? To develop leadership? Um, wow. Um, and it doesn't have to be a business book. Okay. It, I don't, it's somewhere on my bookshelf, and I don't know where it is. It's the Rich Dad, Poor Dad book on the quadrant boy. Mm-hmm. Guy, Guy Kawasaki? Yes. And it's the one where he talks about, it's the quadrant where he talks about here is an employee, here's a small business, here's passive income, here's a big corporation, and what's the difference? I mean, people like my grandmother, uh, she ran a little country store, so she was a small business owner. She never wanted to to open up a chain of (laughs) of grocery stores or gas stations. She never wanted to be that. She just wanted to make a living doing what she was doing. And she did from the time she was 17 until the day she died. Um, so I, I don't know the name of the book. Uh, you could probably Google it and find out. But it, it's really interesting because it tells you which one of these are you. You know, She was a leader in a small way, and that's where she wanted to be. But some people create... They want to create something like a Facebook and, and, and grow bigger. And that is a different type of leadership. Knowing what you know now, if given a chance to go back and do anything differently, what would you change? I would definitely change, and I bet you're going to hear this from other people, um, the amount of money that I spent when, um, when things were good. Um, When things were really good and money was just flowing in and orders were, you know, I'd wake up and everything was like, oh, you've got cash, you've got cash. And I would think, oh, I've got enough money. I can do all these things. And really what ended up being the things that were the best were the ones that cost the least in the long run. Oh, is that interesting? Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure, you know, when you get into a business you, you know, it's easy to fall into that trap when you have some really good years, you want to, to do more. And um, yeah, I would just definitely, now that I know what I know. <laughs> no, it, it's so true, especially when um, we were going through the economic downturn and magazines were just full of articles of how to save money, how to get by with more, how to still have fun, you know, on a budget. And I remember, you know, a lot of the things I was, they weren't anything new to me because I did not grow up with money. I was like, my dad and my mom taught me these things you know, 20 years ago. But it was interesting because I was making more money at that time. And I was thinking like, wow, I, I did not need to spend so much money on certain things. And it, outside of business, like they were even like, you know, um, products for my home, certain vacations, you know, how, how I, things I did for entertainment, w- the things that cost the most money weren't necessarily the things that brought me the most joy or satisfaction. So I think that that translates into many areas. Yeah. I think not growing up with money, once I had it, I wanted to spend it. <laughs> And I think that was really kind of, you know, some of the things like taking a trip to New Zealand or flying to China to visit the factory. And, you know, that was I I wouldn't take that back, really. It was fun. But, you know, I just tended to I hate to say, you know, it's like I didn't budget (laughs) very Mm -hmm. well just because I had lots of money and it was so easy at some point, it you know, I would get these orders for fifty thousand swiggies at a time, a hundred thousand, and and that's a lot of money to come into your bank account at one time. When you're used to you know eating macaroni and cheese, and you know, all of a sudden, wow, I got to that point. So I said, I don't want to eat macaroni and cheese ever again. I'm going to do it, you know, but. It's all, but as an entrepreneur, it's always up and down. 
Right, right. It comes in, it goes out. (laughs) (laughs) And Julie, share with us a success quote or a mantra and why it has meaning for you. My favorite quote is from Helen Keller, and it's called, Life is either a daring adventure or nothing. And I think that's really kind of how I've lived because, you know, to create a product and do what I did was really insane. (laughs) (laughs) If I look at it, I go, there were times I maxed out all my credit cards. I was working three jobs. I was doing, you know, to, to get this dream off the ground. I had absolutely no investors, no mentors, no nothing, no bank loans, nothing. I did it all myself. So that was really pretty daring, I think. And I don't know. It's, I think, big. I tend to think in big projects. Now, that is one of my favorite quotes of all time. So when somebody's looking for like, hey, give me a quick inspirational quote, that's the one that pops into my head. Because if it resonates with you, great. But when I hear it, it resonates like it's a da- life is a daring adventure or it's nothing at all. So I, it always makes me stop and think, how am I living? You know, we talked about playing small moments earlier. And I always ask like, where am I holding myself back? Where am I playing small? Where am I doubting myself where I have no need to doubt? And when I look back at what Helen Keller had to overcome, (laughs) it may, it really puts things in perspective of me. I think I have my sight. I have, I can hear and I can speak verbally, right? She didn't have those things. And she still went on to achieve amazing things. So I'm, I always, it puts it in perspective and makes me think I can do a little bit more. I can go a little bit further. <laughs> I can try a little bit harder. You, so were, you, you just articulated what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And Julie, what is the best way for our, the listeners to connect with you? Info at speakersponsor.com. And is there a social media platform that you prefer to hang out on? I tend to do the best, I think, on LinkedIn. I don't really do a lot with Facebook. Um, Twitter, speaker mm-hmm. sponsor, um, I'm on Twitter, and also Swiggies. Okay, awesome. And you can find all the links and resources shared in this episode at womentakingthelead.com, or you can use the short link, which is womentl.com. And Julie, thank you so much for taking the time to inspire and enlighten us. We are all better for having met you. Thank you so much, Jody. Thank you for joining me on Women Taking the Lead. Were you inspired to take some action today, but maybe don't know where to start? Or maybe you have so many great ideas you can't decide where to focus your attention. Don't let stress or overwhelm stop you from having the career, the business, or the life you want to live. Head over to womentakingthelead.com forward slash coaching or use the short link womentl.com forward slash coaching to sign up for a consultation with me. And to strengthen you on your leadership journey, I'd like to send you off with a quote from Marianne Williamson. So here goes. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Again, thank you for joining me, and here's to your success.